Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, The Threat of Use of Nuclear Weapons and Russia's War in Ukraine, Meeting the Legal and Political Challenge. This event is co-sponsored by Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, Arms Control Association, and Princeton University's Program on Science and Global Security. My name is Ariana Smith, and I am the Executive Director of Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, and will be moderating today's panel discussion, as well as the Q&A segment at the end. Our conversation today about nuclear threats and the esca escalating risk of nuclear use is all too timely against the backdrop of Russia's war on the Ukrainian people. Over the last months, President Putin has issued multiple worrisome threats to engage Russia's nuclear arsenal should, for example, any other country interfere in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Some of the language implicating nuclear use by Russia is more recent than the February comments at the start of the invasion. Last week, Putin threatened a lightning fast response to any direct intervention in Kyiv after the US and dozens of other states gathered in Germany to address aiding Ukraine. Quote, we won't boast about it, we'll use them if needed, Putin said about the quote tools to respond to foreign interference. This is widely understood to be a reference to Russia's tactical nuclear weapons. Just this week too, we saw Russian state television air a graphic depicting a Russian missile targeting the UK with Kremlin ally Dmitry Kislev saying, quote, everything has been calculated already. Another clip referenced the Poseidon nuclear underwater drone causing a nuclear tsunami that would turn Ireland and Britain into a radioactive desert. These instances are not the first times, far from it, that the world has faced irresponsible, immoral, and illegal threats of annihilation by nuclear weapons. The words exchanged by former President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un invoking fire and fury come to mind. The overarching and continuous threat of so-called deterrence policies held by nuclear weapon states are relevant as well. Today, we bring together seasoned voices in nuclear policy here to discuss the legal status of threats of nuclear force, and importantly, various pathways for the international community to reinforce the taboo and legal norm against nuclear weapons threats, and certainly their use too. We'll hear from four panelists today prior to a Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Please throughout the webinar, submit your questions to any of our panelists by the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, throughout the program and we'll aim to get to as many as we can later on. The chat function uh, will not work for Q&A, so please do use the Q&A at the bottom uh, and I'll be looking through those and gathering up questions for our panelists at the end. Unfortunately, at the last minute, one of our speakers, Alicia sanders Zaker from ICANN was unable to join us. We will hear though from Zia Mian, co-director of Princeton's program on science and global security, John Burroughs, Senior Analyst from Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, Daryl Kimball, Executive Director, Arms Control Association, and Ambassador Alexander Kment, the Director of Disarmament, Arms Control, and Nonproliferation at the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. First up this morning, I'll turn to Zia Mian, who will set the stage for us on nuclear threats, their purpose, how they increase the risks of nuclear use, and why the global community needs to work to reinforce the norm against both threats and use of these weapons. Zia is a physicist and co-director of Princeton University's Program on Science and Global Security, part of the School of Public and International Affairs. He is a recipient of the Linus Pauling Legacy Award for, quote, his accomplishments as a scientist and as a peace activist in contributing to the global effort for nuclear disarmament and for a more peaceful world and of the American Physical Society's Leo Sillard Award for his work, quote, promoting global peace and nuclear disarmament. Zia serves on the board of the Arms Control Association and since January, 2022, has served on the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters. Thank you, Zia. Thank you, Ariana. Um, I'm pleased to be part of our conversation today. And since um, we only have a few minutes, I'll try and be very brief in my remarks. As Ariana mentioned, as I'm sure everybody has seen over the recent weeks and a couple of months, uh, the threat of use of nuclear weapons has returned to the center stage of international politics. And the New York Times a few weeks ago actually 
cited U.S. officials to the effect that the possibility of the use of a nuclear weapon has been discussed more in the past few weeks than in years. Uh, one assumes that that possibility of discussion um, is taking place inside the U.S. government. The rehearsals and exercises of nuclear weapons that the Russian Federation carried out immediately before the invasion of Ukraine and then the, the threats that uh, President Putin made um, really did capture uh, the public imagination. I just want to focus on one particular phrase that he used as a way to launch my, my remarks. In his remarks uh, on threatening the use of nuclear weapons, uh, President Putin said specifically that, that for th these remarks were directed at those who may be tempted to interfere in these developments from the outside. In other words, anyone that may attempt to hamper or hinder the Russian invasion of Ukraine, no matter who tries to stand in our way or create threats for our country and our people, that Russia will respond immediately and the consequences will be such as you have never seen in your entire history. Now this in one sense, is a standard formulation because what Putin was saying is that if you threaten us and our goals, then we will threaten you with nuclear weapons and that the consequences will be such as you've never seen in your entire history. This in one sense just is the standard script of the nuclear age. And one can trace it all the way back to President Truman in August, 1945, announcing to the world the bombing of Hiroshima, the first use in war of a nuclear weapon, where Truman threatened Japan that if they do not now accept our terms of surrender, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. And these efforts of threatening the use of nuclear weapons um, have persisted throughout the nuclear age. Almost every country with nuclear weapons has issued some kind of nuclear threat at one time or the other, some more than others. But Truman's threat is specific and speaks to our conversation today. Truman made this threat of more use of nuclear weapons in August of 1945. This was soon after the Charter of the United Nations had actually been signed in San Francisco in June of 1945. And the Charter of the United Nations says very categorically that states will not threaten the use of force against other countries. And the Charter entered into force in October 1945. So the threat of use of nuclear weapons ever since then has been a violation of the UN Charter. And my colleague John Burroughs may have more to say about that. But I want to now move to the question about where we are now. Um, there is clearly disagreement about how to think about and respond to these threats. When President Biden was asked about these Russian threats, he said that there was no reason for US citizens to be concerned about a possible nuclear war. But his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan said that the use of nuclear weapons is something we do have to be concerned about. So the president and his national security advisor don't even agree. And the CIA director, William Burns, said that, you know, we, none of us can take lightly the threat of use of nuclear weapons. And despite these divergences of opinion, um, you know, Putin repeated his threat uh, again. And so it seems clearly that the first threat didn't work. The, that's the need to repeat it. But ever since Truman, and as we're seeing today, there is a certain ambiguity about these threats that needs to be kept in mind. There has been a pattern of nuclear threats that, as I said, goes back all the way to the beginning. And you can read about some of them in a recent issue of Arms Control Today in an article by William Burr and Jeffrey Kimball. But the kind of the place to start is a famous lecture by Daniel Ellsberg in 1959 on the theory and practice of blackmail where Ellsberg pointed out, and I think this is part of what we've lost in our understanding of nuclear threats, 
He says that nuclear weapons have one preeminent use in politics, and that is to support threats. And that these threats can be made by expansionist powers, as we're seeing in the case of Russia, or by status quo powers, which are powers that are trying to prevent somebody else from doing something. He says, and I quote here, call it blackmail, call it deterrence. It's the same thing. So what we see as deterrence policies are also blackmail policies. And the issue of course here is that it's deterrence when you do it, it's blackmail when it's done to you. And the key concern that we have is not just this threat of use of force and the practice of blackmail as a central element of national security politics by the nine nuclear armed states, but that there is this mutual process of threat and counter threat. You make a nuclear threat and the other side makes a nuclear threat. You have commitments to use the weapons because you've threatened to use them and then adversaries will worry about do you mean what you say? And this means that eventually we are locked into a set of choices where two nuclear war machines are actually engaged with each other. And this inevitably increases the practice of escalation and the risk of all out nuclear war. And so I want to bring us to where we are now. And that is that in the case of the United States, US strategic command is very clear through their annual war games, their nuclear war games. And the head of strategic command general, Jen he John Hyten is on record as saying that we play the nuclear war games and every time, how do you think it ends? It ends the same way, it ends bad. And the bad means it ends with global nuclear war. And I quote General Hyten here so you understand, I don't know how many times I've said, I don't want to be on the escalation ladder. I want off the escalation ladder. And for whatever reason, the whole structure of the command was about the escalation ladder. In other words, there seems to be no way that strategic command can find to not have the use of nuclear weapons end up in all out nuclear war. And I think what we have to think about here is that the practice of having nuclear weapons inevitably creates the threat of use of nuclear weapons. Because as Ellsberg pointed out, that's actually what they're for. They're for allowing you to make these threats. And these threats and nuclear weapons that go with them are part and parcel of a larger national security posture. Because the head of strategic command is on record saying that strategic deterrence, in other words, the use of nuclear weapons, is the foundation of US national defense policy, enables every other US military operation around the world. If strategic deterrence fails, no plan or capability of the Pentagon will work as designed. In other words, nuclear weapons and the threat of use of nuclear weapons underpins everything that nuclear armed states, especially the United States and Russia, see as the practice of the use of violence and force as part of their national security politics. So one of the things that we have to be clear about is how to understand this foundational role of the threat of use of nuclear weapons and how to tackle this in legal and political ways. And I'll conclude my remarks by making this one observation. I mentioned the UN Charter forbidding the threat of use of force. More than 25 years ago, the General Assembly of the United Nations actually agreed a resolution on the imperative of having a convention that forbids the threat and use of nuclear weapons. And we have only now with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons reached an international legal instrument that specifically addresses this prohibition on the threat of use of nuclear weapons. So with that, I will end my remarks. Thank you so much, Zia. Comparing deterrence to blackmail is particularly illustrative, I think, in considering nuclear postures globally. So thank you again. Uh, we will turn next to John Burroughs, who will address further the legal status of nuclear threats. Dr. John Burroughs is senior analyst for lawyers, the New York City-based Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. He has represented LCNP in nuclear non-proliferation treaty review proceedings and negotiations on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. John is author of The Legality of Threat or Use of Nuclear Weapons, a guide to the historic opinion of the International Court of Justice, and co-author of Nuclear Weapons and Compliance with International Humanitarian Law and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in the Fordham International Law Journal. His articles and op-eds have appeared in publications including Arms Control Today, 
Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, The Hill, and Newsday. He's also taught international law as an adjunct professor at Rutgers Law School. John, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Ariana. Uh, <clears throat> it is imperative uh, to end the war in Ukraine and the suffering and devastation that comes with it, as well as the risk of escalation to nuclear war. Uh, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy uh, recently released a paper on this subject entitled, End the War, Stop the War Crimes. Ending the war, however, is not my subject today, but rather legal analysis of nuclear threats. International law on basics of war, peace, and disarmament is not faring well now and indeed in the last 25 years. Still, we must look forward and international law is an important lens for doing so. I will not attempt to survey and assess the many forms that nuclear signals have taken over the decades, but rather will concentrate on the quite straightforward issues presented by Russian statements in connection with its invasion of Ukraine. And I'll talk about possible international institutional responses. Uh, President Putin on several occasions, as we, as we have heard, uh, has raised the possibility of Russian resort to nuclear weapons should the United States and NATO states intervene militarily in the war in Ukraine. Uh, on the day of the invasion, uh, Putin said, for those who may be tempted to interfere in these developments from the outside, they must know that Russia will respond immediately and the consequences will be such as you have never seen in your entire history. This is a legally cognizable threat, both credible and specific in form. Statements like Putin's are clearly illegal because they signal the intent to commit an illegal act, here are the use of nuclear weapons, should certain conditions be met. The message is, if you do not refrain from X or if you do Y, we will resort to nuclear arms, not as a matter of general policy, but in a concrete context, additionally here, one of armed conflict. In its 1996 advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice observed, quote, if an envisioned use of nuclear weapons would not meet the requirements of humanitarian law, a threat to engage in such use would also be contrary to that law. In the context of the invasion of Ukraine, Putin's threat is illegal in a second way. It is an element of the unlawful invasion, the use of force against the territorial integrity and independence of a state in violation of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. Uh, the threat seeks to shield unlawful Russian conventional military operations by deterring the US and NATO states from a direct military intervention to assist in Ukraine's lawful self-defense pursuant to Article 51 of the Charter. So far, I've talked about threats in terms of general international law examined in the 1996 ICJ opinion. The conclusion reached by the court was that threat or use of nuclear weapons is generally contrary to international humanitarian and other law. However, uh, the court did not opine on nuclear threat or use in an extreme uh, circumstance of self-defense in which the survival of a state is at risk, nor did it address the policy of so-called nuclear deterrence. A more categorical statement came from the UN Human Rights Committee in 2018, which said, the threat or use of weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons, is incompatible with respect for the right to life and may amount to a crime under international law. There is also some pertinent treaty law on under protocol one to the Geneva Conventions, acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population are prohibited. Also prohibited is threatening that there shall be no survivors. These provisions, however, 
do not definitively capture most nuclear threats. Protocols to the regional nuclear weapon free zone treaties commit nuclear armed states not to use or threaten to use nuclear arms against members of the regional zones. And the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons requires states parties never to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons. However, neither the protocols or the TPNW as it now stands apply universally. Going forward, what can be done in terms of international law and institutions to address the problem of threat of nuclear arms? The basic solution is the global abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, short of that, first of all, it would be possible for the UN General Assembly to take up the problem. One setting uh, could be its current Uniting for Peace session which has already produced two resolutions condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine as aggression in violation of the UN Charter. The first one in its preamble condemned the decision of Russia to increase the readiness of its nuclear forces. The problem could be addressed in a regular session too. The assembly has adopted many, many resolutions over the years condemning use of nuclear weapons going back to the seminal resolution 1653 of 1961. The main problem, whether in a special or regular session, is that states relying on nuclear weapons, even when sympathetic to the need to condemn recent Russian nuclear threats, will not want to support any resolution that undermines that uh, reliance. But a resolution could be adopted over their opposition or without their support. Another possible path would be for the General Assembly to request another nuclear weapons related advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, at least in part on the subject of threat. However, the court has already addressed threat in its 1996 opinion. It will be reluctant to depart dramatically from that opinion. Moreover, within the context of international law, uh, the court is inherently somewhat conservative because by practice, the court normally has five judges put forward by the permanent members of the Security Council. The final approach I'll mention is amending the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. In 2009, Mexico proposed amending the statute to include a specific crime of using or threatening to use nuclear arms. Use of nuclear weapons would, at least in most circumstances, constitute a crime under the general crime set out in the statute. However, specifically listing nuclear weapons along with other weapons already in the statute would remove any ambiguity about use of nuclear arms in all circumstances. In 2011, Mexico changed its proposal to remove the reference to threatening to use nuclear arms, limiting it to using nuclear arms. I have not seen an explanation by Mexico, but it probably reflects the fact that threat standing alone is not criminalized in the Rome statute uh, or elsewhere in international law. Uh, the fact that a threat is illegal, for instance, under the protocol one provision barring the threat of violence to terrorize a civilian population does not require its prosecution as a war crime. Also, actions related to threats such as preparation generally are not criminalized standing alone. In the case of the crime of aggression, its prosecution under the Rome Statute encompasses planning and preparing uh, aggression so long as the aggression has taken place. Mexico has not proposed active consideration of its amendment since 2011, while keeping it on the list of possible amendments. Uh, Mexico's view, view appears to be that pursuing an amendment will make more sense when the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has a considerably larger number of states' parties. If at some point, uh, the statute is amended to add nuclear weapons, uh, 
it will only apply to states parties that, that accept the amendment. Uh, further, Russia, China, the United States, India, Pakistan, DPRK, and Israel are currently not parties to the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, I will close with the observation that 77 years of experience with nuclear weapons since the United States used them in war has taught us that threat and so-called nuclear deterrence are the primary function of the weapons. First of all, let us devoutly hope and pray that this remains the case. And secondly, let us grapple more deeply with the problem of nuclear threat and all the risks entailed by policies and practices that rely on threat as we work to leave the nuclear age behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. It's especially helpful, uh, I hope, to our audience as well to hear your overview of the breadth of legal foundation that exists against nuclear threats in general and your insight into the specific steps that make sense and indeed have already been engaged to some extent during the current conflict. Thank you again. Next up, we have Daryl Kimball taking a look at some of the options the international community has to strengthen the taboo and the legal norm against nuclear weapons and their use and threat of use. Daryl has been executive director of the Arms Control Association and publisher and contributor for the organization's monthly journal, Arms Control Today, since September 2001. For more than two decades at ACA, Daryl has led the organization's education, research, and policy advocacy campaigns on a range of issues, including cancellation of new nuclear weapons programs, negotiation and ratification of the 2010 New START Agreement, efforts to promote entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and strengthen implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. He is a frequent expert source for reporters and policymakers and has written and spoken extensively about nuclear arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation, and the effects of weapons production, testing, and use. Prior to his role at ACA, Daryl has been the executive director of the Coalition to Reduce Nuclear Dangers and the director of security programs for Physicians for Social Responsibility. Daryl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ariana. Um, thanks to LCNP and uh, the Princeton Program in Science and Global Security for working with the Arms Control Association to put this uh, timely and important session together. Um, as Ariana said, I'm going to uh, expand upon some of the ideas that John Burroughs just laid out about possible response options. Um, uh, with opportunities that are coming up uh, in the near future, particularly the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference in, in August. But first, let me just uh, underscore a couple of points that uh, Zia and John made uh, to, to frame this. Um, I mean, it's, we, we have seen um, through the course of the, the nuclear age, uh, numerous um, nuclear threats, um, but, um, it's clear that uh, no leader uh, since the end of the Cold War has made the kinds of uh, explicit uh, nuclear threats that Vladimir Putin has uh, over the past few weeks, um, especially as uh, in, in the course of trying to shield uh, Russia's attack against Ukraine from outside interference. Uh, so all of this, in my view, is a, these are sobering uh, reminders uh, that uh, nuclear deterrence policies create unacceptable risks, uh, that the only way to eliminate the danger is to reinforce the prohibitions and norms against nuclear weapons development, testing, possession, proliferation, uh, and use, and threat of use, and ultimately uh, to pursue uh, much more steadily and quickly the complete and verifiable elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, and I would just also note that, you know, unlike previous crises uh, that we've seen, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, of course, comes to mind. The Cuban Missile Crisis was 13 days long. Uh, this crisis is uh, nearing uh, 13 weeks and will probably go on much longer. And so we are uh, in a world in which we have a heightened danger of nuclear weapons use, the likes of which we've not seen, and that will last much longer. Uh, than you know, perhaps the more acute and serious Cuban Missile Crisis, but longer than the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
so uh, let me pull up a couple of slides here to help um, illustrate some of the uh, response options that I think are important. And uh, so first of all, uh, as I just said, uh, the risk of nuclear use uh, may be relatively low, 5, 10, 15%, but that is still much higher than it has been before. It's hard to put a percentage on it, uh, but it's much higher and it will last for some time. Um, and um, if we really believe uh, that a nuclear war cannot be won, it must not be fought, we also need to reinforce the idea that uh, states cannot be allowed to uh, make such explicit nuclear threats. And these are some of the things that we've heard from Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's repeated them from the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion uh, to the present. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to, to point out in terms of how the international community responds uh, is it's important for everyone, uh, nuclear states, non-nuclear states, governments, non-governmental organizations, uh, to strongly encourage Russian, NATO, and US leaders to maintain lines of communication to prevent a direct conflict between NATO uh, and Russia. It's clear that Putin's threats are designed specifically to draw a bright red nuclear line against um, NATO uh, or US military intervention directly uh, into the, to the conflict. Um, the, we need to be publicly calling for uh, all parties to refrain from threatening uh, nuclear statements. And uh, we also need to be pointing out and, and urging Russian, NATO, and US leaders not to move tactical nuclear weapons from storage to deployment. Uh, not to put strategic nuclear weapons on higher alert levels, as Putin uh, announced he, he would uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the recent uh, aggression against Ukraine. And it's important as we go further down the line that neither side uh, pursue the development of new types of nuclear weapons specifically designed for nuclear war fighting uh, and winning a regional nuclear war. Now, the next opportunity for uh, the international community to address some of these issues is going to be at the 10th NPT review conference, uh, which has been delayed um, uh, since 2020, but it looks as though it will take place beginning August 1st in New York. Uh, so this is an absolutely critical opportunity for uh, nuclear armed states that are parties to the NPT, non-nuclear weapon states parties to the NPT, uh, to keep up the pressure for action on disarmament measures, as well as to emphasize uh, a number of key um, principles that the international community has been trying to uh, reinforce through the UN General Assembly, going back to the beginnings, as Zia and John mentioned, um, that make it clear that uh, the threat of nuclear weapons use um, is against the principles of the, the UN system. Um, so, in addition, I think it is very important that the review conference, uh, the states parties attending the review conference, uh, try to put together a forward looking, bold action plan, not just on disarmament steps, but to reiterate that nuclear weapons use would produce catastrophic health, environmental, and economic impacts, i.e., humanitarian impacts, and uh, to take a, a step forward along the lines of what we've heard from John Burroughs to condemn threats of nuclear weapons use, especially those designed to intimidate, coerce, um, or uh, other states or shield naked aggression, particularly against non-nuclear weapon states. Um, so it's very likely that we're going to see deeper divisions at this NPT review conference than we saw back in 2015. Um, Russia is clearly on the outside right now and um, uh, public uh, arguments at the uh, month long review conference are likely uh, between um, a number of states and Russia over these threats, but this kind of tension needs to be channeled into a productive direction. Uh, so even though consensus, a consensus final document at the NPT review conference may be unlikely at this point, uh, 
And that is always the main diplomatic objective of all of the state's parties to try to come up with a consensus document that reviews the past uh, record of treaty implementation that outlines uh, forward-looking goals to um, enhance implementation and compliance. I think it's important that a coalition of responsible states uh, try to get together behind a platform that calls for the a number of bold disarmament actions. And among them should be a call for the United States and Russia, I'm sorry, the United States, yes, the United States and Russia to resume their nuclear disarmament dialogue. Uh, there was a strategic stability dialogue that had been uh, just started just before Russia's invasion began. Uh, it was in, an important dialogue. Uh, the, the goal was to uh, get to the point where there could be negotiations on a follow-on agreement to the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the only remaining uh, arms control treaty between the two largest nuclear armed states. It expires in 2026. Um, so it's important for, for the NPT states parties, a supermajority to call for resumption of that dialogue and uh, also to urge the United States and Russia to commit not to increase their nuclear weapon stockpiles because it is quite likely that New START will expire without a follow-on agreement. And then in addition, as um, uh, John Burroughs was suggesting the UN General Assembly could do through a, um, a Uniting for Peace resolution, um, it is also quite uh, possible for this supermajority of states to put forward uh, a plan of action on disarmament that, um, that uh, reinforces the idea that uh, nuclear weapons threats are also illegal, uh, citing the 1961 uh, UN General Assembly resolution that declares that uh, such threats uh, are contrary to international law. So I think this is a, a crucial opportunity for the uh, NPT uh, states parties. Um, it is one that I don't believe can be missed. Um, the Russian uh, nuclear threats, uh, the increased risk of nuclear conflict uh, is uh, something that requires uh, united um, action from the vast majority of the world's uh, nuclear armed and non-nuclear armed states. Um, I think it is possible for not just the non-nuclear weapon states that are party to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons to get behind such uh, a disarmament uh, action plan, but also many of the uh, countries in Europe who are themselves uh, threatened by Russia's actions in Ukraine and the nuclear threats, as well as the United States, um, which uh, needs to get outside of its usual comfort zone, uh, which has it working exclusively, uh, or maybe not exclusively, but mainly with the N5 members, the five nuclear armed members of the NPT. So this is a crucial test for, I think, all states uh, as we go into the NPT review conference later this year. And so with that, I will uh, stop and look forward to Ambassador Kement's remarks. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, one more reminder that soon after this segment will be turning to a period of Q&A. I see some questions, uh, some good questions already coming in. Uh, but please do take some time to submit any questions you have. We'll do our best to address as many as we can in the time we have after our panelists conclude. So finally, last but not least, our last panelist is Ambassador Alexander Kement. Ambassador Kement will draw the TPNW deeper into the discussion and touch on how this new treaty, which came into force in January 2021, can strengthen norms against the threats we're seeing today. Ambassador Kement is the Director of the Disarmament, Arms Control, and Nonproliferation Department of the Austrian Foreign Ministry and President-Designate of the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW in 2022. From 2016 to 19, Ambassador Kement served as Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the Political and Security Committee of the EU. He has worked extensively on disarmament issues, including at the Conference on Disarmament and in the CTBTO in Vienna. He is one of the architects of the Initiative on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. He was responsible for the 2014 Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons, for which he conceived the Humanitarian Pledge. 
This pledge garnered the support of 135 states and paved the way for the 2017 TPNW. During a sabbatical in 2019 to 20, as senior research fellow at King's College London, Ambassador Kement wrote the book, The Treaty Prohibiting Nuclear Weapons, How It Was Achieved and Why It Matters. Ambassador Kement, over to you. Uh, yes, I've been asked to bring in the perspective uh, of the TPNW on the uh, threat of uh, use and uh, ways of reinforcing the taboo against nuclear weapon. I, I speak in my own capacity. I also need to say that. Um, first point, um, we have seen very clear, yet sometimes non-specific, but very clear threats of nuclear weapons used by Russia. And this is, as was pointed out by speakers before, fairly unprecedented in recent times. And it has been rightly condemned as irresponsible and dangerous. Moreover, the threats that have been issued by Russia by a nuclear weapon state, are um, they, ha they are made against third parties to prevent them from coming to the assistance of a non-nuclear weapon state in good standing with the NPT that is being attacked by these nuclear weapon states. And this is, of course, also remarkable and bar any semblance of legitimacy of nuclear weapons for deterrence purposes. This has certainly brought the issue back at the center of the international debate. And many people are rightly worried about nuclear weapons and that the taboo against using these weapons may be broken, either intentionally or inadvertently or through any kind of accident. And yet while Russia's threats are indeed irresponsible, reckless and crass, one needs to remember that nuclear threats are the foundation of nuclear deterrence. And here is some overlap with points that uh, Sia has made before. Because nuclear deterrence theory requires credible strike and counter strike capabilities to impose unacceptable costs on the adversary. And it also requires that all actors believe in the resolve that nuclear weapons would be used. So without the double credibility of both capabilities and resolve, meaning willingness to actually use them, nuclear deterrence theory doesn't work. So it's thus questionable to what extent we can even speak of a nuclear taboo. If the practice of nuclear deterrence uh, over decades requires the credible threat of use of these weapons at all times. While the nuclear threats uh, uh, of Russia, uh, sorry, with these nuclear threats, Russia is indeed highlighting both its nuclear capabilities and its resolve, and it does this even verging on um, uh, madman theory, if I may say so. At the same time, it is failing because these threats do not deter third countries of assisting Ukraine, including, including with heavy weapons. And while the threat is of course taken seriously and has led to a broader debate, most experts, as far as I can tell at least, still seem to consider the likelihood of Russia actually using these weapons to be fairly small. And this is also a characteristic of the nuclear deterrence logic, because proponents of nuclear deterrence fundamentally assume, believe and hope that the threat alone will suffice to deter and will result in rational behavior of the actors involved, and that these capabilities will therefore never have to be deployed. In short, the more credible the threat of use is, the more non-use is assumed. And this leads to what was called the crazy reality that nuclear deterrence is a scheme for making war less probable by making it more probable. And translated into the Ukraine-Russia context, this means that the more Russia threatens and blackmails with nuclear weapons to prevent the assistance of third countries to Ukraine, the more it assumes it will achieve its objectives without using these weapons, while at the same time, NATO and other countries currently at least assume non-use, meaning the emptiness ultimately of this threat, and continue to assist uh, Ukraine. And this has, of course, tremendous potential of escalating into a very bad direction. And we see Russia doubling down even more on this threat, which was demonstrated drastically, as uh, I think Daryl was who pointed out the um, uh, TV spot uh, with using nuclear weapons uh, against Ireland and UK. Um, 
And now to the TPNW perspective. This is what we've seen, in my view at least, is a perfect example of vindication of the approach on which the TPNW is based. Because rather than assuming non-use of nuclear weapons in the nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence discourse, it is warranted and indeed necessary to consider the full range of concrete implications of concrete humanitarian consequences of actual nuclear weapons explosions and the risks, of course. And the TPNW just does just that. It moves the debate from the abstract to the concrete. The TPNW is a specific legal response to the evidence on the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons. And this is not an empty um, uh, statement. And these consequences, uh, these conclusions, this evidence is that the short, mid and long term consequences of nuclear weapons explosions are not only grave, but even more catastrophic than previously known. And that is also an evidence based statement. So for non nuclear weapon states, these grave and global humanitarian consequences are the risks to which they are also exposed to against their will and outside their control. And ultimately, as I said, the threat of use cannot be separated from the use. The very basic concept of nuclear deterrence relies on the credibility of use. And what we know today about these humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons explosions and of nuclear risks raise profound and legitimate questions and security considerations for non-nuclear weapon states that need to be considered. And they are drastically shown right in front of our eyes right now. So what level of consequences of use of nuclear weapons on the environment, global environment, global public health, global economy, global food security, mass migratory movements, and the combination of such consequences, um, what combination of that would change the um, nuclear deterrence cost benefit analysis? What in terms of humanitarian consequences is acceptable? and especially for whom and based on what legitimation. That is what the TPNW is asking. So we've seen, we've heard a lot about scenarios uh, of a limited war between India and Pakistan and the implications of the global food security. But of course, exactly that applies to the threats that, uh, uh, that we have in front of us, that have, Russia has made. So the prohibition of threat just as much as the prohibition of use in the TPNW is based on evidence and conclusions around humanitarian consequences and risks that are posed to all states. So those who are concerned about how to strengthen the nuclear taboo, specifically in the context right now, need to ask themselves, how can one strengthen the taboo against nuclear weapons and against the threat of use of nuclear weapons while maintaining believe in nuclear deterrence and basing one's own security on nuclear weapons and essentially the threat of using them. That is logically inconsistent and has, I think, always been a logical inconsistency of the deterrence argument. So the TPNW and the focus on humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, the prohibition of threat and the prohibition of use resolves and addresses this inconsistency and is thus a credible measure to strengthen the nuclear taboo, which I would argue urgently needs strengthening right now. And let me close with a bit of uh, promotion. Um, we've just put uh, um, uh, on the internet the registration details for the 2022 Humanitarian Impact Conference in Vienna, which will take place on 20 June this year to exactly address humanitarian consequences and risks. And this is a standalone meeting, but it takes place on the eve of the first meeting of states parties of the TPNW. So it is very important in our view to reconnect the global debate to not the abstract discussion on nuclear deterrence, but the concrete uh, consideration of what actually happens if this construct uh, doesn't work, the humanitarian consequences and risks. And I stop here. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ambassador Kment, and to all of our panelists for offering your insightful remarks to kickstart this discussion. There have been quite a few questions coming in, so we're going to jump right into those. And Ambassador Kment, I might direct this one to you first, uh, you know, with in mind um, how integral civil society was uh, leading up to the TPNW. Uh, Hannah Cohn asks, what can civil society do to push states and international institutions to more comprehensively address the threat and use of nuclear weapons? So if you'd like to address civil society's um, further role for civil society here, that'd be great. And then I'll open it to the rest of the panelists as well. Thanks a lot. I can't really speak for civil society, but of course, what we, what I think we in the nuclear uh, bubble have thought for a long time that this is a very important issue, but the wider public didn't care so much. And I think that is changing. The issue is very much back. And the only way, and that goes back to the saying, I think Albert Einstein was who said that in 1948, that you need, uh, the, uh, you need a broad public debate about these issues. So that is what the role of civil uh, society is. And I think the way to do that and the way to connect to uh, broader constituencies is exactly by talking about issues that people can relate to, which is the humanitarian consequences and risks uh, of these weapons. Uh, because for most of the time, at least since I've been working in this field, the debate has taken place in uh, security policy expert fora without much linkage or not sufficient linkage to the outside world. And I think now maybe we're moving back into a phase where we can actually have a broader uh, societal discourse, and it really needs to be a global discourse, given the, uh, given the threat. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of our other panelists want to address civil society role here? Well, just very quickly, Ariana. I mean, I, to reinforce what what Alexander was saying. I mean, I, I think there are a variety of methods by which civil society in different countries, um, in different ways, can uh, respond. I mean, today we're focused on the importance of reinforcing the legal uh, norms against uh, nuclear weapons possession uh, and, uh, and use and threat of use. Um, but I think the, one of the things that everyone can be doing in various ways, no matter where they live, um, is to be demanding that and asking that their elected representatives um, or unelected representatives, what are they doing to reduce the risk of nuclear conflict, especially in uh, the context of the Ukraine uh, conflict? What are they doing to condemn uh, Russia's explicit threats of nuclear use? What are they doing to help uh, reduce the role of nuclear weapons in, if you're in a nuclear armed state, the national security policies of that country? And what are you doing to move uh, the world and the nuclear armed states uh, back on a path of nuclear disarmament and the elimination of nuclear weapons. I mean, I think we need to make sure that policymakers are hearing it from concerned people. Um, polls here in the United States show that uh, some 70 to 75 percent of the public is somewhat or very concerned about the risk of nuclear conflict. So this is a critical moment where we need to speak up and we need to recognize that it is an unprecedented moment. Um, these are not ordinary times. And so I think we need to uh, all in our various ways, um, ask these hard questions and demand action. John, I see you have a comment and Zia, I understand you have one as well. So we'll go John then Zia. Uh, I think it's really important uh, for NGOs, civil society, public, uh, especially uh, in the United States, to be saying that the war, uh, the Ukraine-Russia war needs to be brought to an end. Uh, and one of the reasons is uh, the, the risk of uh, nuclear uh, escalation. And so that brings uh, the nuclear dimension in. Uh, but that's where I would start, is uh, we need to bring the war to an end. And the discussion in the United States is going the other direction. Uh, 
Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, is talking about we're with Ukraine until victory is achieved. Uh, but, you know, obviously, uh, hopefully, fairly soon, you know, conceivably, the war could go on in some form for a very long time, but hopefully, it will be ended fairly soon. And it will be a terrific opportunity for advocates to say, uh, everybody forgot in some way or denied the problem of nuclear weapons for many years. Now you've seen that it is a very, very, very real problem. And it's one that, that we need uh, to deal with. Zia, I'll draw you in now. Um, thank you. I mean, I can see that there are lots of questions and so perhaps we don't want to dwell too much on this. I just want to make an observation that um, most people don't even know the nuclear policy of their own country. And so part of the challenge here, I think, is that um, we do need to find ways of having people learn a more appropriate vocabulary and a way of thinking about nuclear policy. The role of civil society now is to have people begin to understand that what seems like deterrence, that which assumes almost as if we're not doing anything bad, somebody's coming to get us, so we have to defend ourselves, that this is actually only one dimension that is at play, as I tried to explain, the same people use the same weapons to make threats against others. And um, as I quoted from Putin's remarks at the very beginning, his threat of use of nuclear weapons was that if you threaten Russia or if you interfere, and this is the standard language, and we need to get people to begin to understand that there is no difference between nuclear deterrence and nuclear blackmail. And as Ambassador Kement said, the threat is the threat of absolutely catastrophic destruction. And so the role of civil society now is to demystify deterrence and actually give people a way of thinking and a way of talking about nuclear deterrence that actually talks about how it works in the real world and not behind these kind of sterile, semi-abstract strategic terms. Um, Daryl, I'll put the next question to you from Jim Burroughs, who asks, is Russia on record as to whether the threat of use of nuclear weapons is illegal? Is the U.S. similarly on record? Well, it might be a better question for John Burroughs to answer, but uh, to my knowledge, no, the United States um, uh, has a country that depends on um, the threat of the use of nuclear weapons to deter nuclear attack against the United States or to uh, deal with non-nuclear threats. Uh, that's a part of the official US nuclear do use doctrine. Does not rule out or does not say that uh, uh, that, is, that is illegal. Uh, and the same for Russia. Uh, that is the problem. I mean, this is, this is where I think the international community needs to take additional bold steps as, as, as we've been outlining today to make it clear that uh, the threat of use of uh, nuclear weapons um, uh, violates the UN Charter, is contrary to, to uh, um, uh, the standards and the norms that have been established, including through the TPNW. Um, and, and, and that's the question that I think members of the international community need to call and press the United States and Russia and France and Britain uh, to, to address and confront. John, I'll let you come in on this question as well. I'm going to draw in um, another uh, question about legal precedent here and how it can be used that maybe you can also incorporate. This one from Peter Herbie, uh, noting that the 1996 ICA, ICJ decision declared the threat or use of nuclear weapons was generally contrary to international law and says they were simply unable to decide on the legality in extreme cases where the survival of the state would be at stake. Uh, since the current case of Ukraine, uh, in the current case, the survival of the Russian state is not at risk, why should it not be possible to hold the ICJ to its word by obtaining a judgment on the illegality of recent threats? Would this be an important step in demonstrating the relevance of the ICJ and its commitment to its own judgments? 
So uh, John, I'll let you uh, take over that last question and hopefully also touch on this one as well. Thank you. Well, I want to thank my brother, Jim, for participating in this uh, discussion. Uh, and one thing that's interesting uh, is that since the 1995 proceedings before the International Court of Justice, and I think stimulated by those proceedings in which the United States made arguments the Pentagon has moved to say that US use of nuclear weapons will only be done in accordance with the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law. Uh, well, from, from my point of view, uh, it, unless you come up with extreme marginal cases, it is very hard for any use of nuclear weapons to be in compliance uh, with the law of armed conflict. Uh, and But that also goes to the, the question of threat, because uh, as the ICJ uh, observed, you know, uh, the legality of threat and the legality of use are intertwined. It is not legal to threaten something which is illegal to do. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist on uh, Russia, but Russia did in its, before the ICJ in 1995, say that international humanitarian law applies to use of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> um, uh, but they, as far as I know, they have not been laying the, the same uh, emphasis on compliance with international humanitarian law uh, in their uh, doctrines. Now, so far as uh, going back uh, to the International uh, Court of Justice, you know, let me answer that question in a sort of a roundabout way. Uh, <clears throat> the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms uh, has been proposing for many years now that the court could be asked for an advisory opinion on implementation of the nuclear disarmament obligation set out in the non-proliferation treaty and importantly in other uh, international law. Uh, well, part of that advisory opinion could address uh, what should be the behavior of states while disarmament is being uh, implemented and in that respect uh, address uh, uh, the the issue of uh, threat. Uh, it's possible, it has been demonstrated to ask the uh, court for an advisory opinion about a very specific situation. Uh, <clears throat> and so maybe some sort of question could be constructed relating uh, to the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. So that's, you know, that's not uh, an impossibility. Uh, the International Court of Justice, many of you probably know, has already weighed in on the invasion. It has said uh, that the purported justification of Russia, that they were invading to prevent genocide in Ukraine, uh, uh, had no basis, and that Russia uh, must uh, cease military operations. Obviously, Russia has disregarded that judgment or that decision of the ICJ, just as it has disregarded the overwhelming uh, vote of the General Assembly for uh, a resolution condemning the invasion as, as aggression. Thanks, John. Zia, I'm going to turn to you with this next question from Elizabeth Schaefer. Uh, Elizabeth asks, how can U.S. officials be persuaded that the threat of using tactical nuclear weapons is not less dangerous than the threat of strategic nuclear weapons due to the risk of escalation? Um, the question of how to convince U.S. officials of any change in nuclear policy these days seems a uh, Herculean, if not nigh impossible task. Um, given the incredible entrenchment of Cold War ways of thinking and budgets and weapon systems and careers, you have to remember all the people in charge of all of this stuff 
you know, go back to the old days of the Cold War. And that's the logic that they bring to all of these thinking of nuclear weapons. If you look at the all the nuclear posture review since the end of the Cold War, nothing fundamental has changed. It's, it's as if the Cold War never ended for these people. Even if the Soviet Union is gone, the nuclear weapons remain and the ways of thinking about nuclear weapons have remained fundamentally unchanged. So I think the issue is not about convincing officials now. I think we've moved past the point of trying to convince them. We've even had presidents who've said, we have a moral responsibility to get rid of nuclear weapons. Remember Barack Obama? And how much change in actual US nuclear weapon policy did we see? The nuclear weapons in Europe that the US has had for decades remained in Europe under President Obama, and they're still there. Um, so I think the issue is now to think not about convincing US officials of this or that. I think we actually have to think about how are we going to confront existing nuclear policies? Because the process of trying to get change through Congress and through argument and debate with this vast NGO community of experts and others who've been struggling heroically for such a long time to bring change, you know, has almost run out of steam as we've seen that contingency actual events on the ground overwhelm all of these debates. So I think we actually have to create a new climate on the ground um, within which this conversation about nuclear weapons takes place. We're not under present circumstances going to be able to convince them. We'll be lucky if we can prevent the US building a new generation of new kinds of nuclear weapons, which is where the debate is now heading. Thank you. Um, another question that I'll throw out to the group and see if anyone wants to answer first is about whether there are concrete ways to de-escalate the nuclear threat in Ukraine right now. One uh, proposal that Reverend Robert Moore is asking about is if the US, France, and UK, for example, declared no first use policies, would that be effective in helping to de-escalate in your opinion? Does anybody want to address that? Daryl? Well, it's a good question. And um, I think uh, if the United States and Russia had policies um, of no first use of nuclear weapons, that would be helpful. But uh, that uh, in and of itself uh, would not eliminate the danger of nuclear conflict. Uh, and second, right now, there is no realistic poss possibility that either the United States or Russia will adopt such a policy. Uh, unfortunately, Joe Biden just completed um, uh, his nuclear posture review after a number of months of um, deliberations. Uh, he decided not to follow through on his campaign pledge to, to have the United States adopt a policy that says um, the sole purpose of, of US nuclear weapons is to, to deter a nuclear attack. Uh, and instead, uh, he preserved the longstanding US policy, um, the wording is different from some of the predecessors, but essentially says the United States reserves the option in extreme circumstances uh, to um, employ nuclear weapons uh, in, in, in conflict. And that is also Russia's policy. I think as I, as I outlined in my presentation, I mean, there are, there are a few things that um, NATO and US and Russian leaders need to do to prevent um, the risk of broader escalation of the war beyond Ukraine, which is what I think is the main uh, danger of nuclear conflict, a direct engagement, military engagement between NATO forces and, and Russian forces. That could happen uh, this, as, as this conflict goes on. And to avoid that kind of direct conflict, what do you need? You need um, clear and direct and, and working lines of communication between the highest uh, leaders in both countries, military and political. We don't necessarily have that right now. Uh, you need to make sure that the countries in NATO are um, not operating as independent actors, um, that they are all part of a unified military command to make sure that you know Poland doesn't make a mistake that uh, the United States or France or uh, Norway wouldn't have made uh, that leads to a wider escalation. Uh, we also need, uh, going to John Burroughs' point about ending the war, we do need, I think, uh, the start of uh, 
uh, direct discussions between the US uh, and Russia about um, a resolution to the conflict. Ukraine needs to be part of that dialogue. Um, Ukraine needs to be central in, in that dialogue, but um, it's important for that diplomatic track to, to take place. So uh, let me just mention those things in, in answer to, to that, uh, that good question. Thanks very much, Daryl. Francis Lynn asks an interesting question, uh, mentioning that uh, Francis is preparing to file a complaint in France against public and private officials who carry out illegal orders of the French government that do not respect the NPT by continuing production of weapons and engaging in threats of nuclear use. Does anyone, any of our panelists, know of any type of legal action envisaged in other states that display nuclear threat and national policy? I think it's a great idea in theory to be able to file suits holding individuals and institutions accountable where we can to violations of treaty law. Um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head of comparable instances happening now, but perhaps one of our panelists does. Well, I, I can speak to that briefly, uh, Ariana. Uh, <clears throat> in the United States, uh, the role of the courts on questions of this kind has become more and more limited over the, uh, the decades. Uh, it's hard for members of Congress to get a hearing on the merits uh, in Congress. It, it requires a certain rather stringent uh, conditions for, for that to happen. Uh, what is possible in other countries, for instance, European countries that are hosting US nuclear weapons, uh, that I can't uh, speak to. Thanks, John. I might throw this question back at you to begin with too, coming in from Cheryl Spencer, about which international court has higher authority, the ICC or the ICJ? She also mentions that the US does not recognize the ICC, so how does this affect discussions uh, of deterrence? Well, the, uh, the International Criminal Court deals with alleged crimes committed by individuals. Uh, the International Court of Justice uh, deals with questions uh, involving states in obligations of states. So there are different kinds of courts. And uh, so the question of precedence doesn't really arise. If it ever did arise, it would be an interesting thing to see play out. <laughs> Was there another part to this question? I think you had it for now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next, let's see. Um, I'd like to draw in Ambassador Comment for our next <clears throat> question. Um. So Ambassador Comment, we have a question here about the distinction, uh, you know, and given the context of the war today, isn't preventing nuclear war more important than stopping the Ukraine war? Are we concerned that some ways of ending this war could increase the risk of nuclear war? And uh, how would you respond um, to that? I think that's a very good and very, diffi very difficult question. I think obviously, uh, preventing nuclear war is must be the highest priority, um, but it's also a huge challenge. How, how do you deal with an actor that's behaving like Russia? So um, I think the response uh, to the nuclear threats from Russia that we've seen from NATO and from the US so far has been very, very cautious and I think very, very good. I think what we are seeing is um, actually the most comprehensive non-nuclear deterrence, deterrence package 
ever with uh, really very important uh, sanctions, plus the attempt to achieve an international condemnation, um, which uh, has been quite successful or not as universal as probably um, some would have liked. Um, and yes, some 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 scenarios uh, uh, can go terribly wrong. I'm afraid I don't think I have uh, I have uh, I passed the buck to some of my <laughs> panelists. Maybe they have a better answer than than I did. Just if you could repeat the question, Ariana. Sure, the question, let me just find it again to make sure I get it accurate. Um, isn't preventing war more important than stopping the Ukraine war? How do we address the fact that some ways of ending the war could increase the risk of nuclear war in general? There are, there are a number of difficult quandaries with this, with this conflict. Um, um, and, um, and difficult moral choices. Um, I mean, I, I agree with with John Burroughs that you know the um, the outcome that would be most catastrophic, that would affect the most number of people, would be if the current conflict uh, escalates beyond Ukraine's borders, and of course, if it becomes a nuclear conflict. Um, at the same time, I mean, there's a moral imperative for uh, the world to support through humanitarian means and maybe military means Ukraine to defend itself. Um, but what's missing, and this is what I was trying to inject, is there is no active diplomacy right now to try to bring an end to the conflict. That doesn't mean Russian capitulation or Ukrainian capitulation, um, but it, it, it is important for that, that dialogue to, to begin. Um, and it's a missing element of Russian policy right now, it seems, as, as well as a missing element of, of, of U.S. policy. This next question is one that comes on, up quite a bit in conversations about the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, Richard Oakes asks, to get Russian cooperation with bilateral nuclear disarmament, should the international and peace community not criticize the prior U.S. use and more numerous threats and worse wars of the past? Uh, I think this is a, a useful conversation to have in terms of um, how nuclear states' past behavior is affecting response to a nuclear state's behavior today. I wonder if one of our panelists would like to dig into this issue. You know, when we're talking about uh, Russian nuclear threats, uh, we shouldn't forget that just five years ago, uh, the US and North Korea were exchanging uh, nuclear threats. Uh, and uh, it was a quite serious uh, situation. Uh, so, what we're facing now uh, is, is not a, a unique problem. It's sort of inherent in reliance on, on nuclear weapons. And uh, Russia is certainly not the only country that has invoked the, the possible use of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, so it's a, it's a global uh, problem that uh, that needs uh, to be addressed, uh, and you know, nu nuclear issues are intertwined with Russia in another way, uh, which is uh, that the U.S. has taken actions, U.S. and NATO have taken actions over the past twenty-five years that have. Um, greatly increased Russia's sense of insecurity <clears throat> and, you know, uh, have probably contributed to the uh, way in which Russia has sort of now lashed out. And I'm talking about uh, withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 
2003, um, putting uh, missile bases in uh, Poland, missile defense facilities in uh, Poland and uh, Romania, <clears throat> um, withdrawing from uh, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty based on an apparent uh, Russian violation. This is just a, a, a few years ago. So uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the United States and NATO have some political responsibility for helping create the conditions for the crisis that, uh, that we're now uh, experiencing. And, and that has uh, uh, nuclear dimensions as well. So now let, let me say the obvious thing, which some people have trouble understanding. None of, none of what I just said excuses the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it needs to be understood as we try to think about how do we move forward. Two brief remarks. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, what we're seeing is pl the playing out of the standard script of the nuclear age, right? This has happened countless times. And in fact, I mean, there are entire books written about uh, nuclear threats and the different circumstances and who's used them and to what effect. And most of the time, it turns out that they are ambiguous. Remember, Putin never actually used the word nuclear in his threats. He just wired, warned of particular kinds of dire consequences. The rest of us filled in the blanks because we know they have nuclear weapons. As you know, Ambassador Kement said, we see what the threat means by virtue of who the actor is that's making the threat. But the fact of the matter is political leaders don't study history by and large. And so they don't pay attention to the fact that nuclear threats in the past um, you know, haven't actually been evaluated on whether they've worked or not and to what extent have they actually made any difference at all. They do what they do because they can. And because it comes to hand and because it serves other domestic political uh, and international needs about status and uh, political uh, purpose. And so I think what we have to think about is that the process of having these threats being made now is just more of these threats will continue to be made regardless of the outcome of this war. Some people will make realize that they have to make even harsher threats. Others will think that they have to be more permissive in making different kinds of threats. But the fact of the matter is as long as nuclear weapons exist, and we're lucky that there are only nine states that have nuclear weapons and feel able to make such threats. But the fact is, as long as they exist, they will make such threats because that's what you do. They are specifically for the purpose of making these kinds of threats. So the underlying issue that we face actually is about the threat of use of force and nuclear weapons as in one sense, the ultimate threat of use of force. And so our real challenge is to deal with this question of the role of military violence in interstate relations and how people wish to be defended. You know, as I was I said in my presentation very briefly, I mean, there has been a long history of uh, nuclear threats through the course of the nuclear age. Um, but I think we need to recognize that what is happening in the context of Russia's invasion of, on, of Ukraine is different in a couple of aspects, a couple of important aspects. Uh, one, we've not seen this kind of overt threat making in the post-Cold War era um, by a major nuclear armed country against a, um, uh, other nuclear armed countries with a war in the European theater. Yes, we've had Trump making threats against North Korea, uh, North Korea making threats against the United States. Uh, that's significant. But this is different in the sense that uh, we've not seen this kind of conflict um, in Europe. And it means that the stakes here are, um, not the stakes, but the risks are, I think, considerably higher because this conflict is going on for a long time. And I'd say all this because this requires a response from the international community. We can't just brush this off as just one of a number of nuclear threats throughout the 
nuclear age. I mean, Zia is exactly right that this is the familiar script. This is the familiar language. Uh, it's hidden beneath all of the, the nuclear armed states uh, policies, but this is, is being done in a way that raises the, the nuclear risk level to, to uh, uh, a point that we've not seen in many, many years, if ever. Thanks, Daryl. Um, and I want to thank all of our uh, participants here today for sending in such great questions. We have quite a few that we weren't able to get to, so I'm sorry about that, but we are uh, out of time for today. I would like to offer our panelists the opportunity, if you'd like, to, to say a few last closing words before we uh, end the program today. Uh, let me just, if I can, since, you know, we have one second left. Um, it's easy to, because this is Europe and because the United States and NATO are involved and the Russians are involved, there is a certain Cold War perception that has, you know, uh, been running through uh, the whole situation in the last couple of months and much of our conversation. And I just want to remind everybody that it was actually only in 2019 that Pakistan and India were fighting over Kashmir and they were using jet fighters against each other and actually shooting them down. Two nuclear armed states actually shooting down each other's jets, which we have not yet seen in the Ukraine war where NATO actual forces and Russian forces actually shooting at each other. And the prime minister of Pakistan at that time made explicit nuclear threats that if the Indians don't stop this in Kashmir, there will be a confrontation. And if Pakistan is losing that confrontation, we will use nuclear weapons. And so the fact is that, and that's a billion and a half people right there in India and Pakistan fighting over Kashmir. So it's worth keeping in perspective that just because we are involved in this particular nuclear crisis, this kind of script, like I said, plays out over and over again in its own way wherever nuclear weapon states are to be found. So we do need to see this not as an exception to the rule, but the practice of politics by nuclear weapon states in the nuclear age, wherever they happen to be. Thanks, Zia. Ambassador Kment, would do you have any closing remarks? Well, just uh, very briefly, I'm actually very worried about, uh, in addition to the nuclear threats that are made by Russia, I'm worried about there's a lot of loose talk about uh, small nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, and so on. Um, I think it is important to think about that if anyone crosses the nuclear threshold, nobody really knows what's going to happen. I mean, there have been hundreds of books written about this, but in reality, nobody knows. We would be faced with a situation of uh, leaders in a crisis under extreme stress. And the whole idea of uh, nuclear deterrence holding essentially rests on that these leaders in these circumstances would back down. And that is just an extremely risky um, uh, basis for international peace and security. And the second thing I wanted to say is that I'm, of course, listening to the, to the debate in Europe. And yes, people are concerned. But by and large, at the moment, you see a bit of a nuclear weapons muscle memory uh, huddling under the nuclear umbrella. We need more. We need to be stronger. All of this uh, is perfectly understandable. And it's very an emotionally difficult time. But I think it is important to remember that if the conclusion from this crisis is a re-emphasis of nuclear weapons, so if the message from Europe uh, from this crisis is a re-emphasis on nuclear weapons, this is nothing else but an invitation for non-proliferation to the rest of the world. I think that's extremely worrisome as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, I'll turn to you if you'd like. Well, I, I would like uh, to do something which you can 
can also do, Ariana, is that's just to thank uh, Arms Control Association and the Princeton program for working uh, with us on this program or giving us the opportunity to work with them on this uh, program. I think it's really, really important that we address the question of threat and deterrence uh, more vigorously uh, uh, going, going forward. And I think this session has been a contribution to that. Thanks, John. Yes, I absolutely reiterate uh, a thanks to our co-sponsors for this event. And I'll leave uh, then the last word of today with Daryl from ACA, if you'd like to have a few closing remarks, Daryl. Uh, well, I think everything has been said. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists. Um, I've learned uh, a bit here, a good deal here. Um, please stay engaged. Um, and I think uh, we'll be, AC, Arms Control Association will be posting a recorded version of this on our website in a few days. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much again to each of our panelists and to all the co-sponsoring organizations, Arms Control Association, Princeton's Program on Science and Global Security, and Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. And thank you especially to our participants for registering and joining the conversation today. Keep an eye out for future opportunities uh, for discussion. As everyone has said, these are important conversations and we can't stop having them. Thank you again.